if. If I. This is the condition, the why, the question mark over each of our lives. If. If I. If I am good enough. If I don't mess up too much. If I go to the right church. If I prove to God my worth. If I pray before I eat, if I read scripture before I sleep, if I do enough good works, if I share the gospel with those who search, if I always give it my best try, if I do the most I can before I die, if, 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 I. Now the problem with these questioning lines is not actually that you're asking if, but that your if is dependent upon your I. Because if you're trying to provide yourself with an equation that assures you of your salvation and you're trying to use yourself as the standard, the cause, the determinant, the foundation, then all you will ever get out of your internal interrogations to the question, have I finally done enough to receive salvation, will be a resounding negative declaration no, no, you aren't good enough. No, you messed up too much. No, you did not do enough good works. No, you did not prove to God your worth. No, you didn't give it your best try. No, you didn't do enough before you died. If your if is based on your I, then your assurance of salvation will always be denied. And yet, for every single one of us, this is what we've tried to base our salvation on self-evaluation. But all we ever get out of this arrangement is condemnation. That's why you feel lacking, no matter how hard you try, because your if is based on your I. It's why you feel disobedient no matter how often you comply because your if is based on your I. It's why you feel distant like a misfit, like a second class citizen. It's why you feel empty no matter how much you supply because your if is based on your I. And your I can never measure up to the standard of God on high. And that's not because his standards are awry, but it's because he is perfect and we always fall short of that prize. And so there is always condemnation for those who are in I. But there is good news. There is gospel free to all without price. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So let's make a new condition. Let's Let's ask a different why. With the old one gone, let's fly a freshly drawn question mark over each of our lives. Let's ask a new if to replace our if eyes. Let's ask if, if Christ, if Christ was good enough, if Christ loved so much, if Christ died to save his church, if Christ rose to give us his worth, if Christ provided bread of life to eat, if Christ fulfilled the scriptures by crushing death beneath his feet, if Christ performed every good work, sought out those who never searched, died the death we should have died, beat the grave to raise us to life, if, 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 Christ. Now, the joy within these questioning lines is that our if is no longer dependent on something that we supplied. Instead, the if of our salvation is dependent on the one who loved us so much that he was crucified. So, 
let's abandon our if eyes and run towards if Christ. Let's move from feeling like I'm condemned to say I'm convinced that neither life nor death, neither heights nor depths, not my own faults or mess ups, not my guilt or distrust, nothing can separate me from the love of God because all my ifs Christ answered on the cross. And so we can ask one final if, and with it, all condemnation is crushed. If God is for us, who can be against us? All right. Well, we could uh, we could probably just say amen uh, right there and close out the night. But I think it's going to lead well into our three week series that we are beginning that I'm excited uh, to start. And um, I can't help it. I just can't help myself sometimes. So we're going to start out by talking about the second greatest sport <clears throat> in the world behind golf. Um, how many of you guys are excited that basketball is about to start up here shortly? Any basketball fans in the room? Okay. Uh, I'm excited. I think the NBA is actually nine days away from beginning. LeBron and AD are going to play Kawhi and Paul George, and it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Um, I, I, I love basketball. I'm excited to watch high school ball as well. Um, any, any basketball players in the room? Anybody who enjoys playing? Okay, awesome. I'm excited about that. And then I'm also excited to start coaching. In fact, I start tomorrow night up at Oakville High School. I, I help train fourth graders through eighth graders uh, in some skills. And, and the kids are always really funny when they walk into skills because they walk in with a little bit of swag and they're, they're so excited because they think when we say skills training, they're like thinking skills training. Like, like they're gonna, we're going to teach them how to shoot like Steph Curry does from like 40 feet away from the hoop. We're going to teach them how to handle the ball like Kyrie. We're going to teach them how to pass like LeBron. We're going to teach them the one leg challenge by James Harden. Like they are expecting like, you know, some, some skills, skills. All right. And so literally I think they think that our passing drills are going to be like, you know, throw it behind the back you know, or, or, you know, throw it between the legs or throw it behind your head. And, and this is what we do. This is what we tell them. <laughs> we say, here's a chest pass. You need to have your palms out and your thumbs down. And so it looks like this. It's really exciting for the kids. That's how you throw a chest pass. That's what, that's what that looks like. And when we, thank you guys so much for that. Really appreciate that. Um, and, and then when we, again, they're like thinking we're going we're gonna to teach them how to do the handles and between the legs and behind the back. And this is what we do for ball handling. We say, hey, protect the ball, use your fingertips, and pound it into the ground like that. They're like, this is so boring. They're, they're thinking we're going to like do drills where they're shooting 30 footers and we, we, we teach them form shooting and we have them shoot from two feet away. And we tell them this, keep your hand in the cookie jar and have your off hand be a karate chop. And we have them do that over and over and over again. And that's not near as fun or enticing, but we get them back to the basics because they're important. And so it was really funny. It was, it was a, a few years ago, there were a couple kids. One of them was kind of a punk. Okay. He was, he was probably fifth or sixth grade at this point, And he just wasn't for the chess pass and for the dribbling and for the stuff where we weren't scrimmaging and just for like the jab step and teaching them basic footwork. And it got to the point where if he did not like the drill, if it was like basic drills, basic training, he wouldn't, he literally wouldn't do it. He would sit out and be like, like you got to just do this dribbling joy. He'd look me in the eye and say, no, fifth or sixth grader. I'm like, I want to punch you in your face, right? Like, no. And so eventually it got to where I was like, okay, you don't have to do it. It's all good. You can sit out if you want. All right. And then there was another kid. And this kid was pretty funny. He was a sweet little kid. Uh, but he had a hard time paying attention. So he never, ever, ever did what we told him to do. And again, he'd be dribbling between his legs, behind his back, ball would be going off his foot and out of bounds. And, and he was so funny. He was this little chunky fifth grader. He was so cute. And I'm like, I'm like, why are you not listening to us? It's just literally just this. And at one point, he literally, he literally put his arm around me and he goes, coach, I'm just not paying attention. That's what he said. I was like, oh, okay, I love you. It's all right, you know. But, but I just kind of let them do what they wanted. They didn't enjoy the basic training. And, uh, and the problem is, is that in fifth, sixth grade, maybe you can get away with that. But now those, those kids are older. 
And the other kids are a little more advanced. The other kids know how to dribble a little bit, and the other kids know how to do the basics. And, and they didn't make the team this year. And it's not because they couldn't shoot half-court shots. It's not because they couldn't throw a behind-the-back pass. We didn't really care about that. It's that they didn't know how to do this. They didn't know how to do that. They didn't know how to do this without traveling every single time they touched the ball. They didn't know how to do the basics that we've been trying to teach them for the last few years. How many of you guys are enjoying Cardinal baseball this time of year, playoffs? How many of you guys watched the inning where they scored 10 runs against the Atlanta Braves in game five? Okay, so a lot of you are going to enjoy this. Do you guys know, you guys know that that should have been a one-run inning? That should have been a one-run inning. And if it's a one-run inning, we, there's no telling what happens in that game. Do you know why it should have been a one-run inning? Okay, this is perfect. Let's get that pad, make it sound super spiritual. We're talking about Cardinals, baby. Let's get it, right? Um, and, 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 and it was first inning, okay? that we've scored one run, it's first and third, there's one out, and Yadier Molina, who is a very slow runner, hits one to first base, should have been a basic double play ball, where the first baseman just goes like this. Then the shortstop throws it back to him, and it's a double play, but a little basic play, hits off his leg, goes out in the outfield, that starts this you know, chain of events that leads us to scoring 10 runs in one inning. Honestly, maybe the reason they lost is because it was just a basic play. The competition's too good. The opposition's too strong for us not to know the basics. And the reason that I share that is because we're diving into a three-week series titled Back to Basics because your opposition is too strong. I believe the devil is too powerful. I believe that this world has worldviews that are, that, are, that are too loud for us to not know the basics of what we believe and why we believe it. And so for the next three weeks, we're gonna talk about it. Tonight, I'm gonna talk about one of the main basics of the faith that kind of bouncing off what we just heard in that video. Next week, Tom's gonna talk about a basic of the faith. The week after that, we're gonna talk about how we treat people, real basic, but a little difficult. So I'm excited. And before you're like, oh, you know, it's not as fun. It's not as enticing. I've probably already heard it before. Jesus talked a lot about the basics. In fact, Jesus essentially kind of said, well, the same thing over and over and over again, just wrapped up in different wrapping paper through different miracles, through different conversations, through different stories, through different parables. Jesus' message was pretty clear. And so we're going to actually look at an example of that in Matthew chapter 16. Curtis, you're doing good, man. You're doing really good back there. Sounds great. Matthew 16 verses 13 through 18 says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Okay. So Jesus is speaking of himself here. And he's, he's referred to as the son of man. He's talking with his friends and he looks at his friends and he said, hey, 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 who are these people saying that I am? What are the crowds saying? What are the Pharisees saying? What are the onlookers saying? Who do people say that I am? His disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. In other words, the disciples are like, people are pretty confused. Their, their, their view of you, it's, it's way off, okay? Some people, he, they could have went on. Some people say you're a fraud. Some people say you're a fake. Some people aren't really sure. Some people are saying you're a reincarnated version of one of the prophets. It's kind of off the wall. People aren't really sure of who you are. And for the record, for the record, I don't want to speak for students in this room, but many, many students in your hallways many students on your sports teams, many friends, many acquaintances, many extended family members would say the same type of stuff, maybe wrapped up in different language. They're confused. Our world is confused. They don't know. They don't know. Some people would say he's just another religious figure. Some people would say he's, ah, he's just like the Christian version of Gandhi or something. Really nice, but I don't know about all the miracles and the resurrection. Some people would say, yeah, he's just kind of my father or my, 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 my parents, God, maybe. Some people would be like, oh, yeah, he's just kind of that Santa Claus up in heaven who does whatever we want him to do. Like we, we could go on and we could go on and on. You're, the, the world is 
confused. You guys know this. Some people would say he's a fr- some people would say he's a fake. I don't believe in this Jesus. And then Jesus looks his friends in the eyes. Jesus looks those who claim to love him and know him and follow him. He looks them in the eyes and he says this. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say? Who do you say I am? Back to the basics. It's a pretty basic question. Hey, you guys have known me, you followed me, you've claimed to love me for a while. Who do you who do you say that I am? And and I want to ask the same question tonight. Give me like 5 or 10 more minutes. I'm not going to be here long. I want to ask you the question. I want you to think about it. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? Cuz I believe your life I believe that your destiny, I believe that your future, I believe that all of your influence in middle school and high school, I believe it depends on it. I believe your worldview, I believe your peace, I believe your hope. I believe it depends on this answer to this question, who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's who you are, the long-awaited one the anointed one, the one chosen by God to come down to the world. That's what Messiah means. He's the anointed one. Jesus is the chosen one. And there would have been many implications that went along with this word known as Messiah. If you were a, if you were a Jewish man or a Jewish woman, you would have been awaiting this Messiah. And there would have been some implications on who this Messiah would be. But there are no doubt two, two words that we could all agree that obviously this is this, these are important words that go along with who the Messiah really is. And the first one is Savior. The first one is Savior. This, this is the Messiah who is chosen, who is anointed to not only come to the world, but to die for the world, to save the world. And so I just want to ask you, do you believe that? Basic question, do you believe that Jesus is your Savior because you're a sinner? You've sinned, you've fallen short, you've done wrong, you've disobeyed your parents, you've lied, you've, you've cheated, you've done whatever it is, you've lied, you've lusted, all these different things, you are guilty. And all of us know this. All my conversations with friends, with family members, with unbelievers, with believers, we all admit there's just something wrong with us. At times we do the things we don't want to do. We don't do the things that we want to do. We're sinners. And if we're sinners, we need a Savior. We need one. That's why he was sent. That's why he is the Messiah. He came to save. He came to seek and save that which was lost. He is gracious. He is kind. He is forgiving. And he can bring salvation to all who believe. And our lives can be changed forever. So is Jesus your savior? Do you trust him for your eternity? Do you trust him that he could save you from your sins? Well, I don't really know. How does that work? Well, Romans 10, 9 says this. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's nothing that you can do. It's nothing that you can't do. It isn't dependent on you. The if is not in the I. The if is in Christ. And if you simply believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he was going to do, you are saved. Jesus is your Savior. That's a big word that goes along with Messiah. Do you trust that? But do you notice Romans 10.9 doesn't just point to a Savior. And the Apostle Peter definitely would have known this as well. The Messiah didn't just come to be Savior, but he came to be something else as well. And Romans 10.9 says it very clearly that you need to confess Jesus as not only your Savior, but as your Lord. Lord. So the Messiah, he is Savior and he is Lord. And what Lord means is that he's your, he's your boss. What he says goes. He's in control. You are not your own boss. God is your boss. If you can trust him to save you one day, you can trust him to lead you today. And so is Jesus 
your Lord? Do you, do, you, do you live and do you love in such a way that he would call you to live and love? Or do you do it your own way? He's Savior and he's Lord. And we don't, we don't like Lord quite as much as we like Savior, do we, at times? At times when a pastor gets up here and says, oh, he, he loves you, he died for you, he saved you, he's so gracious, he's so kind, he's so loving, which we say those things every week, they're so true, that's great. That makes us feel really good. And then when we say, hey, Jesus wants all of you. Jesus wants you to follow him. Jesus doesn't want you to stay in your sin. Jesus wants to make you better. Jesus wants to be your king. At times, that's a little bit more challenging because we want to be in control. But Jesus says, Romans chapter 10, 9 says, you, you can't really have one without the other. And it doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that Jesus is always going to be Lord over every area of your life. But it does mean that Jesus came not only as Savior, but as Lord. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of the living God. And then Jesus replied to that statement that Simon Peter makes. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, we believe that this rock would be the confession of faith, that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, that you're the savior, that you're the Lord, that you're king. On this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church. This word church means gathering. I will build my people. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And so I don't want you just to confess this for you. I don't want this to be your confession just for you. I don't want Jesus just to be your savior and your Lord for your sake, although it's really good. But Jesus says that, hey, if we can be a people that trust that Jesus saves us and Jesus leads us and Jesus loves us and Jesus is our Lord, the world's gonna take notice and through that confession, I'm gonna build my church. I'm gonna build my people. And so your friends and your teammates and your classmates and the kids in the hallways and the kids that you come into contact with in your city, I'll build my people. Those people will come to know Jesus through this confession that he is the Messiah, that he's Savior, that he's Lord, that he is God all by himself. It's basic. It's basic. It's a basic confession. You've probably heard it before if you've been to church. You might hear it every week. But Jesus says that basic confession is going to be what changes your world and the world around you. Father, we love you. And we're grateful for you. And we thank you for who you are and for what you've done in our lives. And for the fact that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, that you are God all by yourself. And Father, I pray that we can trust you not only as our Savior, although that's huge. In fact, I pray that right now. I pray that we can trust, maybe the first time ever, that you have the power to save us from our sins, that we are sinners in need of a Savior and simply believing in you, confessing you with our mouth, believing in you with our heart. It brings salvation. It ushers salvation into our world. And God, beyond that, I pray that not only do we trust you with our eternity, but I, I pray that we can trust you with our today. And we can say, God, you're gonna be the boss of my life. You're gonna be the Lord of my life. I'm gonna follow you wherever you lead me because you're good and you're gracious. And not only are you good and you're gracious, but you are just and you are holy and you are jealous for all of me. And so Father, I pray that we can trust you. Pray that we can love you because you're worthy of everything that we have. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and let's go to God in song.